We're all attached to our stuff, aren't we? Yeah. We're all attached to our stuff, man. Don't touch my stuff. You don't want me to touch your stuff. You know, I, uh, I, I had this little idiosyncrasy at the workplace. Uh, it had to do with my pen on my desk. Don't mess with the pen on my desk. <laughs> I'm going to say this, and now somebody's going to mess with me by messing with the pen on my desk, right? Uh, like I have a pen here in my pocket. I almost always do if there's a po shirt pocket. I always have a pen because I like to use it. I use it as a guide to read. I use things to write, all kinds of reasons. But uh, I don't have any problem with that here in my office. Nobody goes in and steals the pen off of my desk. But when we were in Spain and I was a dean, uh, they gave us these generic pens out, you know. And sometimes I, would, I didn't like the generic pen. I have a nicer pen. But somebody comes in your office and you're talking or something and they need to write something. And they take it and they walk off with your pen. And that would aggravate me so much. And I'd go searching for that pen. So I got where I put my name on a stupid little pen. This is mine. <laughs> Do you have an attach? I mean, that may be my neurosis or whatever, but do you have an attachment to your stuff like that? What about food? Ooh. How do you react when somebody reaches over with a fork to stab something on your plate? <laughs> do you take your fork and stab their hand? <laughs> do you slap it away? Do you yell at them? What do you do? You know, we're sort of possessive about our food as well. and uh, we, some, some people don't mind. You know, some people don't mind. Oh, yeah, go ahead. They don't mind eating out of your plate. They don't mind you eating out of their plate. But other people, oh, my gosh. You don't come within several inches of their plate or life is over, right? It's just too bad. I don't know. Do you ever go out with friends at a restaurant? Or maybe you do this only in family and you order different desserts on purpose so that you can try all of them? You do that? Yeah. We, uh, we, the four, we had a, a group of four went to, to the Olive Garden recently. We ordered one dessert and they brought four forks, of course, and we all attacked it. But since it was a common dessert, it was okay, right? Instead of getting it the other kind of a way. I'm going to read one of our passages today, and I want you to imagine yourself doing this, okay? Imagine yourself doing this. All who believed were together, here we are, and had all things in common. They would sell goods and distribute the proceeds, proceeds to all as any had need. That was all within the group of Christian believers, not with just everybody on the planet, okay? They would distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Wow. All things in common? <laughs> really? What in the world would that be like? Does this sound a little bit like some kind of pie-in-the-sky idealism or some kind of utopia somebody's dreamed up? Well, this passage got me to thinking and asking the question, what does it take to get somebody to share what they have? What does it take to get us to share what we have with someone else, to give to somebody else? What does it take? I think there are all kinds of things that move us to do this, of course. Sometimes we just feel magnanimous. If a, if this magna, magnanimity usually is... Of a, of a rival. If you're a rival and if you win, it's like the, the guy that wins the sports contest and picks up the opponent off of the, off the playing field afterwards, you know. They're being magnanimous. Oh, I'm being generous to you, but it's from a position of power and superiority, at least perceived power and superiority. Some people are moved by that. They, they, they'll give to someone they feel is lesser than them, but we feel a little strange if we give something to someone who's more powerful, is more powerful or in a higher position than we are, right? We feel better about giving someone we think perceives somehow and in a lower position. Sometimes people give in order, not that they're so concerned about the person or the cause they're giving to, but because they want to look good. You know anybody like that? <laughs> you know, you give to something because you want to look good. But this even is part of the corporate practice. Uh, Charitable giving for, for corporations, I'm not going to claim all, but it's very common. Uh, one is it gets a tax write-off, which is a, benef a financial benefit, but also it's a part of their whole PR thing, their branding. How do we want people to look at us? And if they see that we are giving away and helping people in different ways beyond our corporate particular product or service we offer, that means we're really good people and people will feel good about us, right? And sometimes individuals give to make others think better of them. 
That is one reason that moves some people to give. Of course, all of us have to know what it's like to feel pity for someone or have compassion over somebody's misfortune. Uh, I always feel bad when I see the, the person in the street with the cardboard sign they've written on, and I almost never give them any money. First of all, I don't carry cash, so I don't have anything to give it. But I don't do my charity in that way. But I do feel for them and say, wow, what would it take for me to end up being that person standing there holding that sign? Wow. That, that, that would take a lot, wouldn't it? So I would be moved to give them out of that. Or when somebody, there's a house fire. Oh, man, we all sympathize with that. We think, oh, my gosh, I might have a refrigerator in my garage that I could clear out and, and let them use for a time. Or maybe I have an extra piece of furniture or some clothes or whatever it is. We really respond out of that. But if we go to another level of relationships, you know, this, this degree of wanting to give has a relationship, too, to how close we are in relationship with the person, isn't it? So when we get it to family, our spouse or our children, or even our extended family, or when we get it to our best friends that we've been friends with for a long time, in that case, we don't really hold anything back, usually, do we? Out of our sense of love for the persons, our sense of solidarity, and I think one of the reasons we're willing to give and share so freely uh, in family or in these close, close relationships is because we have a sense of, of mutual belonging. It's like, hey, wait a minute, we're connected. We belong to one another. And, and the giving is sort of like, treating them is sort of like an extension of, of taking care of yourself, in a sense. You know? That empathy uh, is, works very, very close there. Well, what's the main thing that moves you to give and share with someone? What are the main things that move you to give and share? Whether it's time, money, resources, whatever that might be, what moves you to give? There you go. That's right. That's one of the things. I want us to listen to the passage again. Because um, it goes beyond the reasons I just mentioned. The reasons are deeper. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Why? would people hold things in common, these believers? Well, one of the reasons that may come to our mind, which is probably one of the weakest reasons, but it's a real one, is empathy and compassion, right? We're, we're together now, we're believers, uh, we've accepted Christ as our Messiah, they were saying, and so out of empathy and compassion, we'll hold things in common. But you know, for, for a group, that won't sustain things for very long, really. You can have a, a compassion and empathy for a time and, and help out, but for that to be a sustained effort, it probably needs a reason that's a bit stronger than that. There's a negative reason that works very powerfully, and that's called a common threat. Boy, you come and threaten my family. <laughs> See how we don't pull together, right? Isn't that what happened in 9-11 at a national level? Our country was attacked, and, and we basically gave our politicians a blank check. Spend all the money you need, but take care of this protect our family, right? That common threat brought us together in a, in a way. Or in Florida, we experienced that with hurricanes. Isn't that right? Uh, I've only lived through one hurricane so far in 2017. It's Irma. And uh, one day, we were without power only about 36 hours, which is like nothing in Florida, right? But Diane and I were taking a walk one afternoon uh, during that without any power at home, and we heard, of course, you hear generators, right? And here were some people out on, on the street and got to talking with them, and they offered to let us charge our cell phones from their generator, generated power. We had never spoken to those people ever. <laughs> we had no connection with them other than we, we, just, we obviously lived in the same neighborhood because we were walking on the street. But because of this common threat and common need, they were moved to compassion, and they offered to let us charge our cell phones. So a common threat can move you to hold things in common for a time. But what moved the first Christians to hold things in common, even to the point, for some of them, to selling some of their possessions to help those who were in the greatest point of need, was a shared vision. A shared vision. This is what 
moved those first Christians to hold things in common. Jesus Christ is the source of this commonality and this bond they had with one another. The person of Jesus Christ. He's the source of that bond. It was the cords of love. They had experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ. They had had their sins forgiven and that had been and, and their new birth had been symbolized. The washing and the new birth had been symbolized in their baptism. And here they were, one in Jesus Christ. Their love of experiencing the love of Christ is what inspired the love for one another. And what they had in common wasn't whether they were male or female or what nationality or what socioeconomic level or their education or any of that stuff. It was the bond in Jesus Christ. That's what held them together. It was their new identity in Jesus Christ and their relationship that binds and holds them together. Like, like this is what happened just a few verses before, verse 38. Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, Last week, I talked about one of the results of Pentecost is that prior to, to the resurrection in Pentecost, Jesus was always localized somewhere. He was here or he was there, and I would be here, but Jesus might be over there. But after Pentecost, as we receive the gift of the Spirit, which Peter just mentioned here, then Christ is in us and Christ is everywhere, right? Christ is in here, not out there. And it's precisely that in here, presence of Christ is what literally binds us together in a Christian community. That is what binds us together in a Christian community. And that means accepting all of the incredible differences represented in this room or those who are watching today. That, that is the commonality that supersedes all of the differences that we have. They join their life to Christ by giving their life to Christ through the repentance and faith and then in baptism in Jesus' name, meaning I now belong to Jesus Christ. I'm associated with him. I am God's child. They have a common identity in faith. They've been baptized into one body in one community. But at the level of their daily lived reality, this presence of Christ in them by the Spirit is where you live that commonality. So that has to affect every relationship, doesn't it? Every encounter with another person. That has to affect the decisions that we make. So their com commonality is their primary connection point in Jesus Christ. But this was lived out in very practical ways. In this passage, it just gives us an idea that one of the ways, the practical ways they lived this was by meeting together regularly. We are meeting together. This gathering here in this place in the name of Jesus Christ today is giving visible expression to this commonality we have through the Spirit of God. And this is why they felt held, hold things in common. Remember how I said that the people are really the closest to you, like family, that one of the reasons we are so generous and we are free to give and take of goods are held in common is because of that deep connection that we feel, right? That's where it comes from. The, the more connected we are, the more generous we are, the more open we are to share whatever we have in our time, our money, or anything to help them and to be just to share and be with them, right? Well, that commonality in Jesus Christ is what provides that deep bond in us. And that's what motivates the sharing and putting everything in common with one another. Now, let's be real. We don't live it to the level of that reality, but we've got to realize that that is the reality. That's where our commonality lies in Jesus Christ. It's not just that we all accept a certain ideas. It's because the presence of the living God in us by the Holy Spirit in our identity as followers of Jesus Christ, that genuine reality in our being, that's where the commonality lies. Not at the ideal. We're going to have different ideas about all, and we'll even describe the faith differently. But the genuine presence of Christ in us by the Spirit, that is the genuine real bond. So what we need to do is to explore the implications of that and how to live into that in a deeper way. In our day-to-day -day lives, 
and in our church life together. How do we live into that at a deeper level? But I want you to, just for a moment, put my seminary professor hat on just a second, that that connection in Christ goes even deeper than what I just mentioned. That commonality of, of, of us being indwelt by the Spirit of Christ that is an expression, that deep connection, expression of what's going on in the being of God's self. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is love, and love requires a giving and a taking. And that beautiful flow of love within the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is expressed, in a way, through this common bond in Jesus Christ. In Christ, God is inviting us to share into that incredible fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the theological foundation. I'll let you go think about that a little more for my next class, right? So how do we live this commonality, this body life, this extended family? I think that's a good term for us, as, uh, as the Christian family, an extended family connection. Well, first of all, let me be clear about what it isn't, because some people have interpreted this passage in different ways. First of all, it's not communism. Some people say, oh, this is Christian communism. Well, no, communism is enforced sharing. There's a coercive element there of the state or somebody or some body that, no, we're going to make everybody equal and be like this. That's not what they're doing here. There is no, th this comes out of the free will of people's hearts. This is not being enforced from externally. Neither is it the abolition of private property. Some people have understood this. Oh, well, Christians don't have private property. Well, that concept was known in that day and time because uh, there were different Greek, group, Greek philosophical schools who were preached, no, we don't have no such thing as private property. Even in the Jewish tradition, in Qumran, the, the sect of the Essenes, you may have heard of the Essenes, uh, they, were, they had withdrawn from society, basically, but once you were accepted into the group of the Essenes, everything was in common. There was no private property. But that's not what's going on in this verse. It says they sold their possessions. It was their stuff. Not, no criticism for them having stuff, but they voluntarily sold it to help somebody that had a greater need. Neither is it enforced equality. You know, okay, everybody gets 10 cents, no more, <laughs> right? No less, but no more. It's not that kind of vision either. That's not a biblical vision. It certainly isn't what's going on in this passage. No, this, this commonality, oops, this Excuse me. comes from our connection to God's love in Jesus Christ. So we can ask a very practical question. How can we in Community United Methodist Church live into and live out this common connection we have in Jesus Christ? Well, I could say a lot of things. I'm just going to say a couple of simple things. But that's a question I want you to take home and work on during the week and think about. How can we as a church, as a community, live out this connectedness in Christ within our community. Because that's what strengthens us and motivates us to reach out beyond this, this church community. But let's focus, first of all, how can we live that connectedness in Christ? Uh, I'm just going to mention two simple things. The first one is, let's not make church something of just casual acquaintances. But let's get to know one another. <laughs> How can you be deeply connected in Christ, deeper than family, deeper than bloodline, and yet not even know one another, right? I mean, sure, if you're a huge mega church, that's extremely difficult, and you're going to know your little group. But we're at the size we can actually know one another uh, and want to get to know one another at a deeper level. And that means spending some time together and listening to one, some, one another's stories. I tell my story, you tell your story. And wow, what a difference. And you know what? After we've shared stories, I will probably remember your name. But not always. I'm going to give myself a way out because I'm not too good at that. But, you know, to get to know one another, there are people here, probably, some of you have probably seen one another for years and probably don't know the story, right? That's one of the things I love as a pastor, getting to sit down with someone and hear their story. It's always fascinating. But it creates a, a, a bond, a commonality. And doing things together. My gosh, whether playing games, doing ministry together, but even just being together, having food. Oh my gosh. We've, now that COVID's moving back, hopefully we can get to eating back together again. 
By the way, this Saturday is community coming Saturday is community care is at, starting at nine o'clock, and they're going to offer breakfast again. We're trying to attract more people in. We're going to offer breakfast, and if you love to cook breakfast, or if God moves you to cook breakfast, talk to Beth and Aline right over here, a little ad right here in the middle. But the other thing is that we need to really lean into our community common vision. We have a common vision as a church. We are. And we are a, a vibrant family of God, sharing the love of Jesus with our neighbor, and we are peacemakers, forming disciples of Jesus Christ. And you know what? The, the healthier relationships we have among us, the more genuine love at a deeper level, and this, to the point that we're willing to share with one another happens, the more attract, the better witness that will be to people outside of the church, and people outside will say, Wow, I want to be a part of a people like that where people love one another or treat one another well and they have this deep connection. What, what's the source of all that? Well, isn't it just because a bunch of people decided to be good <laughs> and civic, civic-minded? It's because of the connection, the live connection with the living God in Jesus Christ. So we want to live into that, rooted in God's love in Christ, that we remember in the Lord's Supper of the heart of love that is part of you, but that is you. You are love. You are goodness. You are truth. You are beauty. You are so much. And we give you praise for that. And that because you love us, and because we experience your love in Jesus Christ, and you would fill us with your spirit and your presence, that enables us to live a vibrant, loving, healthy community. Oh God, I pray your blessing upon Community United Methodist Church and that you would bind us together and show us how we can be live into this reality that is there at the level of the Spirit. And then may that light be, and that love be so powerful in this community that the rays penetrate throughout the surrounding community and others can come to know this incredible love and this living God that we all share. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.